All right, section 7.2 is operations on decimals. And uh, we're going to take a look in this section with addition and subtraction and then also multiplication and division. So addition and subtraction comes very nicely right into play from what we just did in the last part of that last section where we were looking at ordering our decimals. And one of the things that we talked about is lining them up so that the decimal point occurred in the same location. Now, that's how we actually do this in practice. And so we're going to do that with this problem. But then I'm going to actually show you why that process actually works. I mean, this is one of those things where this is an algorithm. Algorithm means it's the process by which we do something. Um, but why does that process work? So to start with, if we were working through this algorithm, what would you do after you lined up the decimal points? Start on the very right. Right. You start on the very right, and you'd say 3 plus 6 is? 9. Great. And then you would do what? Yep, go to the tenth place, which is 3 plus 2, which is 5. And then we would probably bring down the decimal next. Yeah, most of us would. You might do that last, but I, I probably would do it at that point. And then we would do 4 plus 3 and get 7. So but what I want to show you is actually why that's actually working as it relates to fractions. I know you thought you were done with fractions, but this is kind of a cool application, and that's really what happens. So if you think about this, we've got the number 4. And that first three is three-tenths, and that second three is three-one-hundredths. Everybody agree so far? Um, you can think about that three-tenths as three-dimes. You can think about that three-one-hundredths as three-pennies. It's another relationship. Instead of thinking about it as fractions, it also is very helpful. And then we can do that with the same thing with the 3.26. So we can talk about the three, and then we have two-tenths, and we have six-one-hundredths. Now, I've sort of written them on top of each other, at least in part on purpose, in part also because I ran out of space to continue going sideways. But what we can recognize is that there's portions of this that can be added together very easily. Now, there are other portions where we could change things. Like, I could change this denominator that says 10 into a number 100, and then they'd have common denominators. But without worrying about common denominators, I can simply add the ones that already have common denominators as well. So, like, the 4 and the 3 get to be added together because they're whole numbers. The 3 over 10 and the 2 over 10 get to be added together because they already have the common denominator of 10. So that gives me the 5 out of 10. And then the 3 out of 100 and the three, 6 out of 100 get to be added together, again, because they have a common denominator of 100. So that gives me 9 out of 100. So you can see that we do, in fact, have 7, 5 tenths, and 9 one hundredths which is exactly what we got when we did that with this algorithm over here. We got the 7, the 5 in the tenths place, and the 9 in the one hundredths place. So that's why we're lining those decimals up, is because they actually have the same fractional value. And again, if you want to think about it in terms of money, which would also help kids, because kids like money. You might use plastic money just to make sure it stays in your classroom, but which is actually more expensive than the actual money's worth. So you have to decide on that. But um, if you use coins, this works really well as well, because you can talk about taking three dimes and two, two dimes together and say, look, there's five dimes, right? Or talking about taking the three pennies and the six pennies and saying, look, there's nine pennies. Now, you need to be a little bit careful if you're using that to justify, because you don't want to get so many pennies or so many dimes that they want to sort of turn it into a quarter or something, because then we get weird stuff happening in terms of our correlation with what this is doing. But this would be an example of one that works pretty nicely, because nothing rounded to the next value, right? Yeah. All right. Here's an example that uses decimals. A stock price dropped from $63.28 per share to $27.45 per share. Question is, what was the loss on a single share of that stock? Okay, so what is this problem asking you to do? Subtract. So in order to do the subtraction, which I didn't do a subtraction one, we do it the same way as addition. We line up the decimal point. And we subtract component-wise, right? The location where the values are in. So we'll start on the right-hand side, just like we did on the last one. 8 minus 5 is 3. And then we run into a problem because 2 minus 4 doesn't really work. I mean, like, it's a borrowing issue that you've got a problem with. So what do we do? Borrow from the 3. Yeah, we borrow from the 3. So when we actually take this 3, this is money, so this works really well to talk about this. What we're doing is we're taking a dollar bill, and we're turning that dollar bill into 10 dimes. Those 10 dimes plus the two dimes I already had is 12 dimes. Can you see that? 
Could you do that in a classroom with real like paper money and, and coins and things so the kids can see what they're doing when they're really borrowing? Because this idea of borrowing is very common to you. You've been doing it now for a long time. Okay, not as long as me, but a long time. So you think of it as being quite simple and straightforward, but, but when kids first do it, it looks a little bit like magic. Hey, look, this number went down and this other number went up and isn't that cool? Well, it is cool, but it, there's a reason behind that. And money actually works really well to explain that. So now I can do the 12 because I have 12 dimes and I'm going to take away four. So I'm going to get eight dimes. Bring down my decimal point. And I've got the same problem again. I've got two dollar, you know, if you will, two one dollar bills and I'm supposed to take away seven. So I need to borrow. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this six, which represents six tens, and I'm going to borrow one of the tens. So I've only got five tens left. That 10 turns into 10 ones. I've got 10 ones plus this two ones, which now gives me 12 one dollar bills. So I have 12 one dollar bills, of which I'm going to subtract five, giving me which is up seven, which is going to give me five. I already gave you the answer, man. Got to stop doing that. All right, and then I've got the last one, which is five minus two, to give me three. Um, because the problem started out with units and context, the answer needs to have that as well, which means on this 3583, I need a dollar sign. So this is really $35.83. All right, I know that you know how to subtract and add decimals, but I want you to think through this with me because when you, when you go through to explain this to a child, you're going to have to do more than just tell them the operations because you're going to have those kids who are going to say, What's the magic word they like to say? Why? why? But why? Yeah. All right, let's do multiplication. With multiplication, the algorithm that you know says something like this. Multiply the way you normally would, as usual. And then you do this rather odd thing where you count up how many decimal places there are, and you move that many decimal places from the left to the right, and you put the point in there. You guys have been doing it forever. But I don't know about you, but even as I said that, it, it really sounds kind of strange. Why did I count these up and put a decimal point in that place? I mean, like, with the addition, I just brought the decimal point down. So what's the deal? What's really happening? Well, let's find out the answer to the problem, and then I'll show you why it really happens that way. So this is a very straightforward, simple, clean problem. I have the decimal point 3, and then the decimal point with the 7, so 3 tenths and 7 tenths. So what is the 3 times the 7? That's 21. And then if I'm following this algorithm, I say, look, here's one place after a decimal. Here's two places after a decimal. So I need two places after the decimal. So from here, I count over one place, two places, and my decimal point goes here. Right? This is 21 hundredths. This is the answer to the problem. But why did I do that counting bit? I mean, why is that the answer to the problem and not, say, for instance, 2.1 if I just pull the decimal point straight down, which is a common mistake. I mean, we do that for addition and subtraction. Why not here? What's wrong with that? Well, here's the deal. How, how do you think I might be showing it to you? Fractions. Somebody said it. Yeah, this is fractions. So what is the decimal point with the 3 as a fraction? 3 over 10. What's the decimal point with the 7 as a fraction? Seven tenths. And in fact, that's why we, and I, I purposely didn't do it on this one, but this is 0.3, actually three tenths. We say three tenths in terms of the decimal point. We also say three over ten or three tenths in terms of the fraction. So the language actually matches. So what do we do when I multiply fractions? Right, we just multiply straight across. Three times seven is? And ten times ten is? Oh my goodness. 21 over 100. How do I write that as a decimal? 0.21. That's why that worked. Is because I have multiple tens, or if I were doing this with hundreds as, a, as the decimal, um, you know, if, if it was in the hundredths place, I'd have hundreds in the denominator. That's what's happening. I've got tens and hundreds and potentially thousands or ten thousands all in these denominators, so that's why I'm getting multiple decimal points is because of the fractional notation. All right, division. Division is also a bit mysterious. It says, if I'm doing division, I should make the divisor, that means the number that you're dividing by, 
like a whole number. I should turn it into a whole number. So this like 0 0.05 that I'm going to be dividing by, well, just make it a whole number. It's going to be number 5. Well, what did I have to do to make it a whole number? Well, to make it a whole number, I had to move the decimal point 2 to the right. So if I move the decimal point 2 to the right on the thing I'm dividing by, I should move it 2 to the right on the thing that I'm trying to divide. So, I mean, it seems very reasonable, but again, why does that work? So, here's what we do. This is what our division was supposed to be. I say, I want this to be a whole number here. So I move the decimal point 2 to the right on the divisor, which means I have to move it 2 to the right on the dividend. So the decimal point will actually be located after the two numbers now. And then I divide, sort of, so to speak, as normal. So uh, 5 goes into 7 how many times? 1. 1 times 5 is 5. I do 7 minus 5, which is 2. And then I bring my 5 down. 5 goes into 25. 5 times, and 5 times 5 is 25, and I, and I stop. So I actually get the number 15, and I don't even actually need the decimal point because nothing occurred after it. So this answer is actually the whole number 15. So on like a test or something, if we could explain why this word, are fractions like an appropriate thing to use? Yeah, absolutely, okay. yeah. Um, that's what I would expect that you would show. Okay. I mean, there are other approaches okay, to thinking about it, but fractions is why I'm bringing it up because we just did the chapter on fractions, okay. so they work real nice. Yes? When it comes in the classroom, I wouldn't. Um, it's one of those things that it's not necessary, but it's not wrong either. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, now, if you've emphasized in class that they shouldn't do that, that's different, yeah. right? Um, so I had a test that I was grading for a different class, um, and there was something that I had emphasized repeatedly not to do something, and a student did it. Um, and so that, that's a different issue. <laughs> so just keep that in mind. Um, let me show you again why this works with fractions. fractions. That's right. All right, so take a look. We're going to write this sort of in fractional notation. Instead of the division being written as that division sign, I'm going to write the 75 hundredths over the 5 tenths. Everybody good with that so far? It's just a different way of writing division, right? Okay. Um, I don't want the denominator to be a decimal point. Um, in general, having a decimal inside of a fraction doesn't look very clean. Uh, it looks unfinished at best, right? So we're going to change that five hundredths, and the way we can do that is because, because it's hundredths, if I multiply by 100, it will actually become a whole number. But if I do something to the denominator of fraction, I have to do it to the numerator. You got it. So we're going to write it like this. So in the denominator, I actually get the number 5, and in the numerator, I get the number 75. And that's exactly what happened over here when I moved these decimal points. Because the net effect, the reality is that when we move decimal points, what we're doing is we're multiplying or dividing by 10. In this case, since I moved it twice, I multiplied by 10 twice, which means I multiplied by 100. And if I multiply by 100 on a numerator, I have to do it to the denominator and vice versa. So this actually gives me the 75 over the 100, which becomes the exact same division I did just a minute ago. I'm not going to do it again, but it's the same division now that I did a minute ago. All right, let's take a look at the next part, scientific notation. Scientific notation is um, a very helpful tool in some situations. It's a very unhelpful tool in others. So to start with, let's talk about what it looks like. Scientific notation has a basic form. It looks like a number A times 10 to some power. But that number A and that power have some stipulations on them. First of all, the number A needs to be a number between 1 and 10. It it has to actually be less than 10 strictly. So if you have actually the different, like do I put a 1 or do I put a 10? Like if that's the situation you find yourself in, you put a 1. Okay, so there are, that's going to be a very limited amount of time that it matters. But you're looking at numbers that are numbers between 1 and 10. The exponent on the 10 is an integer. So an integer means that it could be positive or negative. It means that it's a whole value. So our exponent is not going to be fractions or decimals. Our exponent is not going to be square roots or something weird like that. It's positive and negative whole numbers. And it, and it could be the number zero as well. Now, that would be a case where it's an unhelpful notation. But because of the way the definition is defined, it could actually be the number zero as the exponent. 
What we're going to be focusing on here is we're going to be focusing on changing the notation between standard notation and scientific notation and vice versa. Okay, before I get to those points though, let's talk about the other fact that I mentioned here when I said sometimes it's useful and sometimes it's not. Any thoughts? When in the world would scientific notation be useful? If the number's really, really big, can you give me an example of something where the number would be really, really big? If you have a multi-million dollar company. <laughs> okay, that'll work. So if you had something where you have a dollar amount that's very large, like, um, like you said, a multi-million dollar company, maybe if you're talking about something like the federal deficit, that might be a number amount that we would be looking at. However, even with dollars, it feels a little awkward. There's another situation that makes it a little bit better in terms of using scientific notation. Yeah? Miles from like the sun or something? Yeah, if you talked about distances of something in science, right, like the distance between Earth and sun uh, in miles or something like that, that would be an example that would make a lot of sense. It's a very, very large number, and I don't know of you, but I don't want to write it all out. So scientific notation gives me a condensed way of writing something instead of having to write it out. There's another situation, though, not just really, really, really large numbers. Really, really, really small numbers. What might those kind of things be? Yeah, can you give me an example, Carrie Ann? Yeah, that's where I tend to go to, is something with atoms and protons and neutrons and electrons. God, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, so if we're dealing with something that's exceptionally small, so small that talking about it in terms of the decimal expansion gives me lots and lots of zeros before I ever end up with something that's not a zero, that kind of thing. So this is good for really small or really large numbers. It's not good for the amount of money in your bank account. It's not good for your height or your weight. I don't care how tall or how much you weigh not good. Those kinds of numbers just, it doesn't make any sense to put them in scientific notation, okay? All right, so let's actually take a look at how these work. We're going to look at the first one, standard numeral to scientific notation. So when you're working with the standard numeral into scientific notation, you're taking something that's either a very large number, or, and typically, or a very, very small number, and you're wanting to put it into this times 10 to the power business, okay? So what do you do? Well, the first thing you do is you look at the number, all written out in its beauty, and you figure out where the decimal point goes. So the decimal point is going to be located in such a place that it creates a number that's between 1 and 10. That's the first thing you do. Now, we'll do one so you can see. Here's an example. The first one, example 2 here, 298,000. It's not exceptionally huge. I get that. But we can still work with it in the same way. So if I've got 298,000, where would I choose to put that decimal point to make it a number between 1 and 10? Yeah, between the 2 and the 9. So my decimal point is going to go here. So that's the first thing you do. That's step one in converting to scientific notation is figure out where the decimal point is going to go. So my answer when I get here in a moment is going to be 2.98 times 10 to something. And the question is now, what is that something? There's lots of ways to sort of, maybe not lots of ways, but there's at least a couple of ways to think about how do you get that exponent. The one that I'm going to show you is an intuitive approach instead of worrying, did I move left or right? The way that's often taught and the way I remember be being taught has to do with, well, did I move left or did I move right? Because if I moved left, it's going to be either positive or negative. If I move right, it's going to be positive or negative. But then I have to remember it in the reverse order when I do it the reverse way. I don't want to remember any of that. So here's how I'm going to suggest that you think about it. You count the number of places you moved, right? So the original decimal point was over here. And if you count the number of places you moved, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, this exponent's going to be a 5. The question in your mind should be, but is it positive 5 or is it negative 5? But there's no question that it's a 5. It's just the sign on the 5 that's the question. So how do you decide? Well, my suggestion to you is to think about it this way. If it's a large number, it should be a positive exponent. And if it's a small number, it should be a negative exponent. And that will work whether you're moving in this direction from standard to scientific or in the reverse. Large number, positive exponent. Small number, negative exponent. So what's this one? It's a positive. I'm going to have a positive 5 as my exponent. And 
that really is all there is to it. It's positive because it was a large number. Now, we are going to go the other direction as well. We're going to take scientific notation and turn it back into a standard numeral. Okay? So, what we do is we do the same thing. We think about moving the decimal point, the number of locations, as the exponent. So, if you take a look here at problem number three, the exponent has negative five in it. But the point of what I'm saying right now is that it's five. Okay? You're going to move the decimal point five places because of the five. The question is simply, do you make the value smaller or do you make the value bigger by moving that decimal point? Well, intuitively, the number will get bigger if the exponent was positive because positive exponents correlate with big numbers. And the number will get smaller if it's a negative exponent because negative exponents correlate with smaller numbers. So this number right here, whoops, over here, has a negative exponent. So this means we're going to get a small number because the exponent's negative. So I have 3.2 that it starts out as. Which direction would I have to go if this number's going to get smaller? It'd be going left. So I'm going to put myself several zeros over here and see how many I need in the end. And I'm going to move the decimal point how many places left? Five, because the exponent had a five in it. So here's one, two, three, four, five. So the value in standard numeral would be a zero, a decimal point, followed by four zeros, and a three, two. And you could choose not to put the zero before the decimal point. I don't care. That doesn't make any difference to me whatsoever. That's just preference, okay? So this is the standard numeral that's correlated, or that correlates with that scientific expression. All right, one more problem for scientific notation. This problem starts out in scientific notation. I have 8 times 10 to the 12th, I have 6 times 10 to the 15th, and I'm going to find this problem's answer, and the answer will also have scientific notation in it when I'm done. Now, there are parts of this that look like other parts. That is to say, 8 doesn't look like 10 to the 12th, but 8 looks like 6. Right? I mean, they, they, they look like one another. They've, they've got sort of the same visual picture. So because this is multiplication, and all of this is being multiplied together, I can multiply in any order I want. It's called the commutative property, and we've talked about it before, but this is something that you know to be true, right? If I take 2 times 3 times 5, well, I can multiply the 2 times 3 first, or I can multiply the 3 times 5 first. It doesn't make any difference what order I do the multiplication in. Not only that, because that was the associative property that I just mentioned there, it doesn't matter if I do the 3 times 5 or 5 times 3. That's commutative. So I can reorganize this in whatever way makes the most sense for the problem I'm working with. So for me, in this problem, I can write 8 times 6 and sort of group those together. And I can write 10, 10 to the 12th times 10 to the 15th and group those together. Now, what you really don't want to do is to turn all this into standard notation. I don't want all those zeros, and you don't either. So, so don't go making lots of zeros everywhere. It's not needed. Now, what is 6 times 8 or 8 times 6? 48. What is 10 to the 12th times 10 to the 15th? 27th. 27th, right? That was a property of exponents we did in the last chapter. Am I done? No, I've got several people saying, no, what's wrong? Why am I not done? I mean, I did all the multiplication. Right. It wants us to write the result in scientific notation. So I don't want this to say 48. What do I want that number to actually say? I need it to say 4.8. That's where the decimal point would have to be because I need a number between 1 and 10. But if I change that to being 4.8, that exponent 27 has to change as well. Any idea what it might change to? Is it going to be 28 or 26? That's the, that's the kicker because I hear both of you deciding. Carrie Ann? It is like dividing by 10. Nope. Because that would actually change both pieces of this. We don't want it to actually change. We just want the notation to look different. The value has to be the same. Did you have an idea? Yeah, so let me tell you it in two ways why it's 28. Okay? One of the things that you want to keep in mind is you don't want the value to change. 
at all, right? So if you want to see a real practical reason of why this is happening, what you really have here is you have 4.8 times 10, that's what 48 would have been, times another 10 to the 27th. So that's why the 27 is becoming a 28 in terms of actually looking at the values. You're adding the exponent with 1 with the exponent of 27. Now, again, I tend to not think about it in that way. I tend to think about it from an intuitive perspective. That is, this value was larger than 10 to begin with, correct? It was a large value, which means the exponent would have to get more positive, larger, if I change it. So it changes to 28. It doesn't matter to me how you think about that. That's your choice. But we do end up getting a 28 on the problem. Okay. All right, we're going to stop there for today.